So first of all, I know you're all wondering, what is he doing up here? Uh, and in fact, Steve Rumble really should be the person presenting this paper since uh, he's the primary author and it's the, this paper is the basis of his PhD dissertation. But uh, Steve took a job at Google Zurich and really does not like airplanes. He took a boat to get there. <laughs> there was apparently one boat a year and so he had to leave in January. And I was not able to convince him to fly back. I tried all of my coercive techniques, but unfortunately I, I gave him the final dissertation signature a little bit too soon and lost that lever. So, so I'll be presenting the paper today and then Ankita will be there in the poster session this afternoon to answer additional questions. Okay, so to start off with, I think we are in the middle of the second great data migration in computing history. The first great data migration happened in the 1970s when the primary locus of data shifted from magnetic tape, tape to disk. Today, I believe we're undergoing a shift from disk to DRAM. We're seeing more and more applications that keep all or almost all their data in DRAM, and we're seeing an explosion of, of storage systems that manage data primarily in DRAM. So in this talk, I'll argue that if you're building such a system, it makes sense to organize your memory using the techniques from log structured file systems where you actually think of your memory more like a tape drive than DRAM. So to start off with, I'll first talk about the problems with traditional memory allocators. You'd think after 50 years that we would have solved the memory allocation problem, but in fact we haven't. Uh, there is no general purpose allocator today that can boot, do efficient allocation that can also handle workloads that change and make efficient use of memory at the same time. And so as a result, most existing allocators behave very poorly in the face of changing workloads. They give up that in order to get the other things. In RAM Cloud, we decided to take a different approach. In the RAM Cloud storage system, we decided to structure memory like a log using techniques from log structured file systems with some modifications that I'll tell you about. And the result of that is a mechanism that looks kind of like an incremental copying garbage collector. It's actually quite efficient. I'll show you two additional twists we added on to the basic log structured mechanism. The first is that we have to manage both disk and DRAM in RAM Cloud, and we, use that with a, we do that with a mostly unified mechanism, but with slight policy differences for the two that allow us to optimize the cleaning cost significantly. And then second, I'll talk about how we can run the garbage collection or cleaning process concurrently so that in the normal case, applications see no interference from the garbage collection that's going on in the background. And so the result of this is that we can get those big three things, high performance, high memory utilization, and the ability to handle changing workloads. And I'll argue that this makes sense not just for RAM Cloud, but in fact for any DRAM-based storage system, you should be thinking about organizing your memory using log structured techniques. So first, a quick introduction to RAM Cloud. RAM Cloud is a new large-scale storage system for data centers with the interesting attribute that it keeps every byte of data in DRAM for its entire lifetime. The system aggregates together the DRAMs of thousands of servers in order to provide a coherent key value store accessible by applications over a data center network. Each of the storage server has two components. It has a master component, which manages the DRAM of that machine and implements the key value store mechanism and responds to client requests. And then each storage server also has a backup component which manages disk or flash to provide replicas of data stored on other servers so we can recover from crashes and power failures. And RAM Cloud is optimized to use state of the art high performance networks that provide very low latency. And with these networks, RAM Cloud can offer latencies on the order of five microseconds for any client application running in the same data center to read a small object from any RAM Cloud server. So one of the natural questions in a system like this is, how do we store information in the DRAM of these servers? And you might think you know, a natural answer would be, use existing storage allocators. There's a lot of them out there. They've been studied for years. Surely one of those allocators must do a good job for you. And unfortunately, uh, we decided the answer to that question is no. And this slide illustrates why. The problem is workload changes. And to illustrate that, uh, Steve put together a collection of benchmarks where he benchmarked seven different allocators. Those are the clumps of columns on the slide. Using very simple workloads that allocate 10 gigabytes of live data and then start replacing that data with, with random or various kinds of overrides of objects of different sizes. The, the total amount of data stays constant at 10 megabytes in each work, 10 gigabytes, sorry, in each workload. That's the red line in the graph. 
but the workload changes halfway through each benchmark, shifts from one workload to another. And what Steve did is to run the benchmark and then compute the high watermark of how much actual memory that particular allocator used to service 10 gigabytes of live data. And the answer is that every single allocator and this, under some workloads used at least twice as much memory as was actually needed. So for example, the column pointed to by the arrow is workload eight running under glibc malloc, where it required about 20 gigabytes of memory to hold 10 gigabytes of data. And you can see that's by no means the worst. They're allocated, over allocated by three X or four X in order to service the workloads. Now you might ask, well, does this really matter? You know, how often in fact do workloads change? And if you're talking about a single run of a single application, perhaps not that much. And so many of these allocators would work fine. But a storage system has to handle many different applications that come and go. And so one application might do one workload and then immediately be followed by another application with a very different workload. Or even the same application over time, its workload could change. For example, you expand all of the records in your application to add additional data that you didn't use to represent. And so the result is that if you want to build a storage system, you have to be prepared for workload changes. And if we were to use one of these allocators, we would have had to have over allocated memory by at least a factor of two and maybe more if we wanted to be absolutely certain that we'd be safe. Otherwise, some unexpected workload change could cause a sudden explosion of memory usage and your application stops because it's exhausted memory. Now to see what's going on, it's interesting to separate these allocators into two groups. The first group of allocators are those that copy, that, uh, sorry, do not copy storage, like malloc. Once it's allocated, it must stay. Screens off. Screens off. Ah. Is it back on again? Thank you. <laughs> the first collection of allocators are the non copying allocators, like malloc, where they can't move a block once it's allocated. You know the drill here, you end up with fragmentation where there's lots of small blocks of free memory that are hard to use, and so you end up with wasted memory. So the first thing to realize is if we want an efficient allocator, it must be a copying allocator. If you have a non-copying allocator, you're vulnerable to workload changes. Well, we have one example of a copying allocator here. That was the, the Java JDK garbage collector. You know how garbage collectors work, which is they can scan all of memory, compress all the objects down to one end of memory, and combine all the free space. Into, a, into one big free area. So this solves the fragmentation problem, but unfortunately they suffer from an even worse problem, which is that sooner or later, every garbage collector, even those that say they're incremental, must do a scan of all of memory. They must look at every block of memory in order to find all of the pointers and update them when they move objects. And this is very expensive today, and it's getting worse as memory sizes get larger and larger. So as a result, all of the garbage collectors wait a long time to collect until a whole bunch of free space has accumulated so they can get back a lot of free space for the work of collection. And the result of that is they end up wasting even more memory than the non-copying allocators do. You know, the state of the art for the best garbage collectors, they tend to over allocate memory by three to five X. And furthermore, they have very long pauses when they do these global collections. For example, at least three seconds was the minimum pause time we could get with the Java allocator. Now, to put that in, in context, three seconds, in RAM Cloud, if a server crashes, we can reconstruct all of its data from disk on other servers in the cluster in one to two seconds. So doing a garbage collection that takes three seconds makes no sense at all. We'd be better off just shooting the server in the head and reconstructing. So if you put these together, there are two requirements we need to fill in order to provide an efficient allocator. First, we have to use a copying approach and second, we need to avoid global scans. There must be a mechanism whereby we can recollect the free space incrementally, moving data around in little chunks that's much more efficient and that also allows us to pick the areas with the most free space. Fortunately, storage systems have a fundamental advantage that makes this possible, and that is that pointer usage is tightly controlled in storage systems. Typically, all the pointers are stored in well-defined index structures. There are no circularities. Typically, given a memory block, you can easily find all of the pointers for it. And the result is this provides the basic hook we need in order to build an incremental copying storage allocation mechanism. The bottom line is that what I'm going to show you couldn't work in the general purpose cases that those other allocators serve because we depend on this fact that we control all the pointers. And in general, you don't, you don't control the pointers in a, a general purpose programming language, so you're stuck in the ruts that those two other classes of allocators suffered from.
So the result of this is that we can achieve the three goals of having fast allocation, handling workload changes, and also using memory at 80 to 90 percent utilization without major performance degradation. So now let me talk a little bit about how RamCloud does allocate memory. And as I said, it uses log structured techniques. So each master server in RamCloud organizes its DRAM as a log, an append-only log. And that log is divided up into things we call segments that are eight megabytes each. Now, in order to handle crashes, each of those segments gets replicated on a configurable number, typically three backups elsewhere in the cluster. And a master scatters its replicas across the entire cluster in order to maximize the bandwidth that's available for crash recovery. In addition to the log and memory, the only other structure in a master is a hash table that's used to look up objects in the key value store, given their table identifier and on a key for the object within the table. So with this scheme, allocation is really fast. Just append to the end of the log and update the hash table. Deletion is also really fast. Just add a tombstone record to the log to mark the object dead and then delete the hash table entry. The issue is, of course, what happens when memory fills up by that time, probably some objects will have been deleted, and eventually we have to reclaim free space in the log. And as you may know from log structured file systems, that's where the log cleaner comes in. It's a simple form of garbage collector where it operates by finding a few segments that have a lot of free space in them, and then copying all of the live objects, which we call survivors, to one or more new segments at the head of the log. And then once that's done, the old segments can be freed for use for new data. And we, the freeing occurs not just in memory, but also at that point, we can delete the replicas on backups so that disk space can be used for new segments. So the basic idea is, is very simple, and this meets the two requirements. It's a copying algorithm, and it's incremental. We can pick the segments that are most attractive for cleaning. And so ideally, if we do this right, the segments we're cleaning have a lot more free space in them than the overall memory or disk area does. So with this approach, the efficiency of storage allocation all comes down to cleaning cost. How much time and effort do we spend doing cleaning? And that is determined by the utilization of the segments we clean. That is, what fraction of the data in a segment that we clean is still live? That data has to be copied. And you can see that as the amount of live data in the segments increases, gets closer and closer to one, we end up having to copy more data, so the work we do goes up. And we get back fewer and fewer free bytes as a result, so the benefit goes down. And then if you take the, the ratio of those, how much work for how many bytes of free space, that number goes to infinity as the utilization goes to one. And by the way, this is a property of every copying storage allocator. Fundamentally, if you do a copying allocator, the closer you get to 100% utilization, the poorer the performance must inevitably be. So furthermore, in our system, we end up with an interesting conflict between DRAM and disk. Remember, we're keeping the same log both in memory and on disk, and we're cleaning both of them together. In DRAM, what we care about is the memory utilization. Memory is very expensive. And so we'd like, ideally, in DRAM to run up close to 90% utilization. Now, that's going to result in a lot of work during cleaning. But in DRAM, we have actually quite a bit of memory bandwidth available to us. And so, in fact, it's reasonable to pay that roughly 10x copying cost in order to clean at 90% utilization. So we'd like to run memory close to 90% utilization. But disk is a different story. Disk, the problem is that bandwidth is really expensive. You know, a disk only has about 1% uh, of the bandwidth of the typical memory of a machine. So 100x less bandwidth. We really don't want to be cleaning out here because if so, the whole system will bottleneck on disk bandwidth for cleaning. So for the disk, on the other hand, capacity is really, really cheap. Uh, Over-purchasing so over your disk by a factor of two is not going to significantly increase system costs. That's mostly determined by the memory cost in RAM cloud. And so for disk, we'd like to run closer to 50% utilization, which then results in a pretty reasonable cleaning cost. Well, the problem with this is that, at least in the first version of RAM cloud, the cleaning was tied together. When you clean memory, you clean disk and vice versa. And so we couldn't run memory at 90% utilization and disk at 50%. We would have had to choose either get efficient utilization of memory and terrible performance or good performance and terrible utilization of memory. The solution was to use a two-level approach to cleaning where we clean in memory and on disk with slightly different policies. So in the actual RAM cloud systems, there are two forms of cleaning compaction and combined cleaning. Compaction, compaction operates only on memory. 
it works a single segment at a time, find one segment that has a bunch of free space, and then squeeze all the objects in that seg uh, segment down into less space and free the remainder of the segment for use in other segments. That operates a segment at a time, has no impact at all on the disk. The logs kept on the backup stay in their original form, but it does actually maintain the mapping between those. That is, the segment in memory contains exactly the same set of live objects that the segment on disk contains. Then the second form of cleaning is the combined cleaning I already mentioned, where we take a collection of segments, copy them to a new segment, both in memory, and then we also have to replicate that out, of course, to the backups as well. And then once that's done, we can free the information both in memory and on disk. And then there's a, there's a piece of RAM cloud I'm not going to talk about called the balancer that decides when to run each of those two forms of cleaning. When you combine that together, we end up with the best of both worlds, where we can optimize the utilization of memory, effectively squander memory bandwidth, which is relatively cheap, to take good utilization of the capacity, and then do the reverse on disk. We allow the disk to effectively expand where its log is now only about half full, so we've wasted space, but we optimize the bandwidth to disk. And I'll show you in the performance measurements that actually works pretty effectively. The second twist, the second twist for our, our cleaning in RAM Cloud is that we do the cleaning concurrently with regular operation. So we're going to spend a lot of time cleaning in RAM Cloud, particularly in compaction. That runs, if you're running an intensive workload, as you'll see, cleaning is running almost all the time, trying to keep up with allocation. And so we don't want that in the critical path where it slows down normal read and write requests. Fortunately, it's, it's relatively straightforward in order to run the cleaner in parallel because this log is immutable. Once a segment is written on the log, it never changes, and so we don't have to worry much about interactions between the cleaner and background updates. So the way cleaning works is that it can run in separate threads, actually several of them potentially, each working on different segments, and the cleaner writes its new data to what we call a side log, some segments that have been allocated but not actually joined into the main log. So while the, the cleaner is working, it writes its new data, that's the gray information in the slide, to these survivor segments, and while that's going on, the main log can be used for normal re requests, handling additional writes, without any, any interference. Then once a cleaning pass is finished, those new segments get stitched in to the head of the log, as in the bottom picture on the slide, and they, at that point they become part of the log. So the result of this is there are only three synchronization points between the cleaner and the background operation. I'm not going to go into the details of those, uh, read the paper about that, but it's relatively straightforward and those synchronization points have very little impact on the performance of the system, as I'll show you with some performance numbers. Okay, so now let me move on and talk a little bit about the performance of the system. For RAM Cloud the, and the, the log cleaning mechanism, the most important performance measurement is how does the system throughput degrade as memory utilization increases. We know it's going to degrade. It's going to become terrible as we get close to 100% utilization, but how close can we get before it becomes really bad? So to do this, Steve built a bunch of benchmarks. It's really a very simple benchmark with one master and a single client generating a super intensive workload. He used uh, 10 outstanding concurrent multi-writes, each with 75 writes per request. This is basically the highest possible load that could be generated in the system. We think actually much more intensive than any real workload. And then for these measurements, use a very simple access pattern with fixed size objects in each individual measurements. And then a couple of different workloads. The blue workload is a Zipfian workload, so it's a fairly high level of locality in the accesses. And the green workload is a uniform access workload where all objects are equally likely to be overwritten. And then ran these with different utilizations. And in RAM Cloud, we can choose the utilization by, by picking how much data we create and how large the overall log is. So we're able to control the utilization between 30 and 90%. So a couple of things you can see here. First, indeed, the performance does drop as you get workloads closer and closer to 90%. But in fact, we can run at 80 or 90% even with this super intensive workload. At 80%, these are the numbers over on the right side of the slide, you see performance degradation in the worst case about 27%, and that's in a, in a situation where there's no locality. If you have any locality, the worst case performance degradation, that is how much slower at 90% compared to say 30% utilization, is typically in the five to 15% range. So this appears to show that you could run at 80% workload, 80% uh, memory utilization with any workload we could imagine, and then in many of the workloads, 90% utilization would also work. In, in the worst case, the performance degrades by about a factor of two with small objects and no locality, 
And so if this was your workload, you'd probably be better off spending 10% more for memory in order to drive the utilization down to 80%. You'd get enough additional performance back if that would make sense. To show the benefit of the two-level cleaning scheme, Steve also ran measurements where we turned off two-level cleaning, enabled only the combined cleaner. Those are the additional lines you can see on this graph, and you can see performance is dramatically worse. Even in the case of small objects where the degradation is, is smallest, the, the uh, turning off combined cleaning costs 20 to 30 percent in performance, and for large objects, performance is 5x or more worse if you don't have the two-level cleaning. So the two-level cleaning makes a huge difference and it's really the key in order to be able to run the system at high memory utilization. Uh, one other performance measurement I want to show you is evaluating how well concurrent cleaning works. So for this, Steve took our, our nastiest workload, which is small objects, no locality, high memory utilization, and ran a single client with one outstanding request at a time. Uh, so this is a case where you would care a lot about latency. And then we measured the latency, and this shows the cumulative, it's a reverse cumulative distribution on a log-log scale. So in other words, each data point on here says, for this x coordinate, say up here, we're at about 18 microseconds, this says 10% of all writes took longer than about 18 microseconds. And you can see there's a very small number of requests that took out to thousands of microseconds or even tens of milliseconds. And Steve ran two experiments. The blue line is normal RAM cloud running with the cleaner. The red line, he just turned the cleaner off. And so we ran this on a machine with an enormous amount of memory and just ran the experiment until memory filled up and then stopped. So the cleaner never ran. The interesting thing here is that out to about the 99th percentile, the curves with the cleaner on and off are almost indistinguishable. At the, the median, there's only about 300 nanoseconds, or about 2% difference in average latency between the system with the cleaner on and the system with the cleaner off. And again, the curves are out to 90, the 99th percentile, essentially the same, and then by the time you get to the 99.9th percentile, so the slowest 1,000th one th of all of the IOs, then you start seeing a significant difference, about a millisecond per request with the cleaner on versus 100 microseconds with the cleaner off. Steve did a little bit of analysis on that. We believe this is head of line blocking as the master is trying to replicate the new write data. Uh, that small write request gets stuck behind a large request from the cleaner to send out a whole new segment. And so that's why you see the, the delay here. But again, out to the, about the 99th percentile, the cleaner has essentially no visible impact on latency. So I've skipped in this talk a bunch of stuff in the paper. I'll just give a quick advertisement for it here. Among the topics you'll see if you read the paper are first, what's the metadata we keep in the log? It's actually quite different in RAM cloud than in log structured file systems. And in particular, there are these things called tombstones that are required to mark deleted objects. So when we're doing crash recovery and we replay the log, they don't spring back to life. Tombstones ended up being, I think Steve would say, the second worst possibility he could imagine, where the worst possibility was everything else he tried. They have lots of problems and we have uh, some mixed feelings about them, but in particular, they tend to be the bottleneck for cleaner performance with small objects. Uh, but we have not been able to find a better way than that. So you can read about that in the paper. Second issue is deadlock. Uh, when you're running at very high utilization, you run the risk of memory deadlock because RAM Cloud needs to have space to free space. For example, deleting objects requires you to write a tombstone to the log, which takes memory, which takes space. And so the paper describes uh, what are the factors that can determine whether you deadlock and how to prevent those. The bottom line is we, can, we could run up to about 98% utilization before we start running the risk of deadlock. Third additional issue in the paper is that during the process of building the log structured memory system in RamCloud, Steve ran a bunch of simulations. And when he compared those to the original numbers from the log structured file system paper, he couldn't duplicate the original results. And after a lot of work, including consulting some of the authors of that paper from a long time ago. Uh, our conclusion is that there actually is a fault in that paper, and it has a bad, the segment selection algorithm is actually not correct in that paper. In fact, what turns out is the simulator for that paper used a different algorithm than actually published in the paper, as far as we can tell. And a small change to that algorithm improves the performance by about a factor of two at high utilization. So if you're actually building something with log structure, you should read the paper and find out what that change is to get that factor of two. Uh, next thing Steve did was to see how well RAM Cloud's mechanisms might work in other storage systems. So he took our log structured memory and he used it to replace the storage allocator in memcached. 
He found that if he did that, uh, memory resolution in memcached improved by 15 to 30 percent, and throughput also improved a bit, and the cleaner had almost no impact. In fact, cleaning works even better in an all-memory system where there's no disk than it does in a system with disks. And then finally, he did some benchmarks against other systems, Hyperdex and Redis, and the bottom line there is that RAM Cloud provides a better combination of, of performance and durability than either of those systems. So very quickly, some related work. I've already talked a little bit about some of that in storage allocators. There's tons of work out there, but these allocators all suffer because they can't uh, control their pointers. Uh, but I will say that some of the newer slab allocators are starting to look a lot like a log structured system where the slab corresponds to a segment. Uh, I've talked a little bit about log structured file systems. The difference is that in RAM Cloud, having all the, the information in DRAM actually provides several interesting efficiencies. And then finally, there's a bunch of other storage systems out there that are increasingly using DRAM, and you'll see some of the same techniques in those systems. For example, if you're doing distributed replication, you're almost certainly going to end up with something that's log-like for that. And furthermore, we're seeing tombstone-like objects used to control deleted objects in those systems. The difference is that we don't yet know of any other system that actually uses the log-structured mechanism for DRAM. They tend to use traditional allocators, and thus they're going to suffer from the performance issues with them. So just to conclude, if you're in a world where you control your pointers, and I think for those of us here, that is our world, then logging is a really efficient way to manage storage because it gives you this ability to do incremental copying collection. And as a result, you can use memory at high utilization, get great performance, you can do the collection in parallel so you don't have pauses, and you can tolerate workload changes pretty well. This worked really, really well for RAM Cloud because it also gave us a unified approach for managing both memory and disk. And so we had to make only just a couple of slight policy changes in order to optimize the performance of each of those. But I would argue if you're building a storage system that uses DRAM, you should be thinking about log structured techniques for that storage. So with that, I'll stop and take your questions. Thank you. I don't know if you could all hear the question, but the issue is when you're doing compaction, the residual space you get back is only a fraction of a segment, and so doesn't that mess up and cause us now we're doing variable size allocation and get us back into inefficiency? Yeah, so the, the bottom line, which I didn't have time to explain, is that seg segments are actually divided up into fixed size seglets of 64K, and we use that as our basic allocation mechanism. And so uh, that, that smaller segment will be a smaller number of seglets, and it'll free some additional seglets, which can then go on to take part in new segments. Okay. So we still have fixed size chunks, they're just smaller than a segment. Smaller, and, and those aren't reflected on disk. Just in and those are not reflected on disk, that's right. Disk is only in the eight megabyte chunks. I actually had a quick question. Um, you didn't actually mention when you clean. Do you clean all the time? Do you wait for any certain point? Was there an optimal time? Uh, when do we clean? The answer is it generally makes sense to wait to clean until you absolutely have to. We've cr tried various schemes where we initially thought we ought to start cleaning sooner so we have enough time to free memory before it runs out, but it actually makes sense to run just about to the brink of destruction before you start cleaning. That turns out to be best because the longer you wait, the more free space there is and the cheaper it is to clean. <laughs> 